gather round, children. I've got a scary story for ye. It's the story of my fiber nightmare. Ah! <laughs> Ooh, spooky. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today, I'm going to tell you a cautionary tale, a classic, be careful what you wish for a story. It's an epic saga of man's inhumanity against man, also known as me getting 5 gigabit optical fiber trenched to my house by the phone company. Along the way, we'll discuss the evolution from things like modems on through ISDN, T1 lines, T3 lines, DSL, cable, and finally fiber. I'll tell you the scary tale of what happened in my own case and what you need to avoid if you're ever tempted to sign up for fiber. You see, I've been online a long time. A long, long time. As in going back to the early 80s, in fact. How long ago was that in terms of tech? Well, my first modem was 300 baud and it came with this Commodore rotary telephone which you had to dial by hand each time to connect and then flip a switch when you heard the carrier tones. They really weren't joking around back then. Of course, the first thing I wanted when I had 300 baud was 1200 baud and auto dial, but it was out of my price range for quite a long time. And from 1200 you might step up to 2400 and as the years ticked on by to 9600 and 14.4 and 28.8 and 33.6 and ultimately 56k. So I don't think anybody actually saw more than 33k no matter what their modem was rated. This poverty of bits continued on through college where our dial up to the PDP 11s and VAXs was still limited to 2400 baud well on into the 1990s. To give you a sense of what that means in practical terms, I remember queuing up a bunch of Z-Modem downloads with the knowledge that it would take about one hour per megabyte. It seemed everybody else was getting ADSL, but I was stuck in the dark ages because I lived a little further out of town and it just wasn't available in my area. But there's always the phone company, and while it can be wicked expensive, they're usually willing to sell you connectivity no matter where you are. And back in that day and that time, the best I could do was known as ISDN, or Integrated Services Digital Network. It's a circuit-switched telephone network system that allows digital transmission of voice, video, data, and other network services all over the traditional copper circuits of the public-switched telephone network. The simultaneous handling of multiple digital services like voice and data over existing telephone wires without the need for significant infrastructure changes meant it was available almost everywhere. It utilizes the existing copper wire infrastructure to deliver higher bandwidth services by digitally encoding the signal as opposed to the analog encoding used when you connect a modem with a voice line. Here's one for the comments section. If Shannon's theorem limits the bitrate to about 35 kilobits over a modem, then why can a digital signal like ISDN sent over the same wires almost double the bitrate? An ISDN line clocks in at about 64 kilobits per second. I signed up for dual ISDN, and lucky for me, the MSN dial-up service back in the day actually supported dual-channel connections, and that meant I could run at 128k. And remember that your basic home 1 gig service is about 8,000 times as fast as ISDN. Your next step up from there would be a T1 line rated for 1.5 megabits. Those were some big numbers back in the day, and only businesses could really afford such things. My university was connected to the next node over on the internet by a T1 line, for example. The next step up from a T1 is a T3 line, also sometimes known as a DS3 line for digital signal line. It's a fiber optic connection rated at 45 megabits a second. After Microsoft, I had started a small software company and I needed to get connectivity for our offices. And because we hosted some of our own web content, we needed decent bandwidth. And this was the solution that I picked. The 45 megabit speed was symmetrical and cost upwards of $10,000 a month. At home, I was still rocking ISDN back then, so if I wanted to download something large enough, it was actually faster to drive to work and do it there. Eventually, though, DSL and cable internet would make it to my home area, and I signed up. I forget what the first service tier that I ever had was rated at, but it might have been 1.5 megabits. So suddenly, it was like having my own T1. It's a lot faster than a 128K, but still glacial by today's standards. Fortunately, the service level would improve over the years, and so recently I was getting as much as 1 gigabit down, but the big problem was that the up speed remained really slow. My best was about 40 megabits per second. For a lot of residential consumers, this wouldn't be a problem as they don't upload a great deal and so wouldn't hit that asymmetry. In my own case, however, the fact that I've got a YouTube channel means that I spend a lot of time uploading footage to YouTube, and that can take forever at DSL upload speeds. A mid-length 4K video used to take more than an hour to upload, and that comes right in the middle of the publishing workflow, so it was always annoying having to wait around for it to finish. 
By the time I started to search in earnest for something genuinely faster, our phone company had changed hands, or at least names, more than five times. I think it had been Bell and then AT&T and GTE and Frontier and Xfinity and so on, if I recall correctly. And now the phone side of things was being taken over by another company, one that even had fiber right in their name. And if anybody is going to offer fiber, it's going to be a company with fiber in their name, at least I figured. And so I went to their coverage map, and lo and behold, my house was just within their colored service area. I was stoked and couldn't wait to call the next day. But when I got up early and did so, I was told they did not service my address with fiber. I tried to explain that the map showed me as in the coverage area, but she said the map must be a mistake. Fiber wasn't available in my area, and there were no imminent plans to bring it to me either. What a disappointment. I wrote to the fiber company all the way up to the VP level, but I never got a response. Then one day I decided to do a video on the 10 gigabit and 25 gigabit fiber that I have interconnecting the shop and house systems. It was a bit frustrating to have all this internal connectivity and then be limited to a 40 megabit upload pipe, and I vented about it a bit in the episode. A few weeks later, I guess they must have seen the episode as representatives from the fiber company reached out. I offered what I thought was a great deal. Pull fiber to my house, sell me to the standard service plan, and I'd make a full episode detailing the install and setup and deployment of 5 gigabit fiber to my home. They get maybe a couple hundred thousand interested views for their trouble, and I'd get to make a video. They weren't interested, but they did make a counter offer. Just pay them $25,000, and they'd bring fiber the last mile or so to my house. Now, I really, really wanted fiber speeds, but I wasn't about to write that kind of check for it. Unless I did what anybody would do. I negotiated hard and tried to find somebody else to help share the cost to bring it down to some reasonable amount that I could tolerate. In the end, after weeks of back and forth, we reached an agreement. $13,000 to pull fiber to the neighborhood and to the homes, and I could split those costs with as many neighbors as I could convince to go in on it with me. I reached out to all the neighbors and made my pitch, and a number agreed to jump on the fiber bandwagon with me. It was enough to bring the install cost down to some reasonable level for each home, and so we signed an agreement with the fiber company. It's not my first rodeo when it comes to contracts, so I was careful to insert a couple of important stipulations. One, that they used commercially reasonable best efforts to get the fiber installed in a timely fashion, since I didn't want it to drag on forever. And two, the service had to be capable of 5 gigabits at least. I didn't want to pay up front and go through all this and then have them suddenly find out that the run is too far and it's only capable of 1 gigabit or something like that. Now all I had to do was wait for the fiber install. And a few months later, I got a call from the fiber company's sales department excited to tell me the news that fiber was about to be available in my area and I could sign up for as little as $60 a month. The only problem was that she had no idea what I was talking about when I referred to the $13,000 install contract. I couldn't figure out why she would be calling me otherwise. And then I figured it out. She was calling everybody in the area, now newly serviced by the fiber company thanks to my capital investment in their network. They were offering fiber service to everybody around me at these standard rates. Now, I guess I could have expected that this was going to happen at some point. I didn't have to wait too much longer, however, and eventually the fiber made it to my block and then to my house. Pretty soon, I figured they'd be trenching the cable in, but they didn't. I guess they were having some kind of issue with their trenching contractor, and they were switching providers, and in the meantime, they just ran the cable down my fence and over my lawn. And it would sit there for a few months before they eventually came back and trenched it. A little while later, they came out to install the fiber modem and connect me to the service. It only took about an hour, and I immediately plugged in the 10 gigabit port on the fiber modem into the 10 gigabit port of my Dream Machine Pro, and sure enough, I had service. I did a quick speed test, and it was way faster than I was used to, even if it wasn't yet what was promised, coming in at a couple of gigabits down and slightly better than that up. And then a week or so later, the phone call came. They explained that because they had installed fiber, they would be disabling the copper phone lines at my home. Apparently, their rationale is that when they set up a new subdivision and cable it with fiber, they only provide fiber and not copper. So by their logic, if new customers didn't need copper lines, then neither did I. The frustrating part was that it was a policy matter and not a technical thing. I guess their billing system didn't want copper and fiber at the same address or something like that. And there's only one problem with that logic. I wasn't new construction, and I've been here 15 years. And that means I have legacy hardware and equipment that relies on the phone system like the house alarm. It'll fall over to cellular backup if the main line goes down or is cut, but I don't know if that's 100% reliable, and not having a phone would mean only a single layer of protection. I also have a gate, and just like in an apartment door, when somebody pages us from the gate, it rings our phone. 
We can then press a button on the keypad to open the gate, and so of course all of this is dependent on having working phones. It's also a tad more complicated because this is a larger home and it features a business phone system, kind of like if it were a small hotel. You can page people, make announcements, call room to room, and so on. With four kids, it's been incredibly handy, and so even though the Panasonic KXTA624 PBX is now 20 years old at least, it works well and I don't have much interest in changing it. My Dream Machine Pro does support voice over IP calling, but I'd need to buy new IP phones for every room, and I decided that I wanted to avoid doing that if I could. It seemed like a lot of unnecessary change and expense to compensate for their policy issues. They reassured me that the transition would be fairly seamless and that they would install a voice over IP box that provided a dial tone replacement for my two phone lines, one for voice and one for fax. Nothing in our contract had contemplated any changes to our telephones, but nothing in the contract precluded them from doing it either, so I was kind of stuck with it. And so a couple of days later, the deck comes out. The copper was deactivated at the central office, and he installed what I believe is called an ATA, or Analog Telephone Adapter. It's a small box, and you give it an internet connection, and it provides two sets of live phone lines as outputs. We grafted those output lines of the ATA into the point where the copper used to connect, and that provided the phone service to the house. After about another 20 minutes, he had the phone lines working, and then he left. The phones quit working entirely about half an hour later. And then, for the next several months, we repeated a grim sequence over and over that went something like this. First, the phones would die in the sense that they still had a dial tone and were connected to the central office, but we couldn't call out, and any attempts to call us were met with, this number has been cancelled and it is out of service. This was clearly a back-end issue, but every time they would try to send texts out to the house to fix it, it accomplished nothing. After a couple of days of phoning support and sending emails to whomever I could, the phones would then start working again, at which point the internet would stop working. I'd open another support ticket, and soon enough the internet would come back up, but only at about 80 megabits of throughput, which I eventually deduced was just enough to host two voice calls from the phone lines. In other words, they were giving me enough data for voice over P connections, but every other time they fixed the phones, they'd cancel my 5 gigabits of data in terms of provisioning. So I would have one working or the other. And then, even while the phones worked, we couldn't open the gate and the alarm system reported phone trouble. It turns out that the analog telephone adapter they give you wasn't properly passing DTMF tones. Those are the cute little harmonic tones that a touchtone phone makes when you press the buttons. They can be passed in band, out of band, or not at all, but our box was doing something more insidious. It would capture the DTMF tone and then pass only a quick blip of that tone, no matter how long you actually held the button and it turns out that the little blip it did do was not long enough to trigger our gate. They suggest that I call the gate company and get it changed over to pulse dialing. Now, not only is that a little crazy, but it doesn't work that way. It wasn't the dialing of the house that was the issue, it was DTMF tones that were being eaten during the call, but nobody I could get a hold of even knew what a DTMF tone was, at least at first. We went around and around in this loop for months, most of which was spent on my backup cable internet, without phones and with the gate and alarm compromised. I made the obvious protests about the non-working fire monitoring and so on, none of which seemed to do anything to speed the process along. Finally, at some point, they sent out Dennis. Now, Dennis is an older fellow, perhaps my own age, and when it comes to phone guys, as they say, he's seen some things, man. He's the guy they keep in the back of the warehouse until nobody else knows or remembers how to fix whatever it is that's broken, and then, and only then, do they send Dennis. He was familiar with the DTMF issue and installed a different ATA box that handled the tones differently, and in the span of about 10 minutes, he'd fixed all of the gates and the alarm issues. And he jumped on his Harley, did a wheelie, and rode away into the sunset. But my gate worked. My alarm worked. My phones worked. My internet worked. Thank you, Dennis. Well, for about 20 minutes anyway, at which point the phones went dead again, performing the same death spiral of steps that we'd seen so many times before. Since it had all worked when Dennis left, it was clearly something on the back end or in provisioning or accounting, but their first answer to everything is to have another tech come out. I'd say I had at least 20 service calls from the fiber company along the way, and at some point a young tech came out and he installed this huge 10 gigabit high-speed Wi-Fi router in the panel for the sole reason that it has a 10 gig as well as a 1 gig port, so he basically used it as a switch, and it allowed him to split the internet signal off to both my router and the phone ATA at the same time. So now I had two ATAs and a Wi-Fi router all hanging off of the fiber router, and things are starting to get ugly. I mean, here's a photo of the setup they left me with, and you decide if you want this spaghetti factory in your garage. I know I didn't, and so once they finally had everything up and working solidly for a couple of days, 
I ripped all of their modems and Wi-Fi and nonsense out of the cabinet and replaced it with a single Microtech four-port switch. I heard the distant rumble of a panhead and Dennis rode back into the scene. He ambled into my garage, hooked up his laptop and a 10 gigabit adapter and at first got the same results as me. But then he solved it. The problem was that I and he at first were testing against the closest drop from the fiber company, whereas to get a full 10 gigabit internal link, somewhere I actually needed to be testing against downtown Seattle. When we did that, we finally saw the five full gigabits at the fiber modem. I was still having some speed issues internally, which I ultimately traced back to the Dream Machine Pro. It turns out that I could get the full five gigabits at the Dream Machine itself, but at the desktop client, it was much less. But oddly, at the desktop, I'd see two or three gigabits down, but still the full five gigabits up. The reason is that I have deep packet inspection and country identification and other security features turned on. And the UDM Pro simply doesn't have the horsepower for more than about two gigabits of that a second. It would be nice if they offered an updated model with a 10 gigabit capacity, because I'm kind of married to the Unify ecosystem at this point, but I'm not aware of anything yet. If you know of a Unify-based solution, please let me know in the video comments. This all means that I'm faced with the question of whether I turn on the security features or leave them off for maximum speed. I think Benjamin Franklin said it best, those who would trade security for performance deserve neither. And so, for now, I leave it on as I consider what to do for a more performant main router solution. The reality is, though, that almost no sites can deliver much more than a couple of gigabits anyway, which is why I'm not paying their $300 upcharge that they want to go to 10 gigabits. Similarly, as long as your SSD and CPU are up to the task, I can pull about 2 gigabits per second from Steam, which means the download times are more than cut in half. But at 5 gigabits on the upload side, you're again normally limited by the website you're talking to. With YouTube, I find that I'm getting about 1 gigabit up, which is only a fifth of my actual capacity, but it's still more than 25 times faster than my old internet was. That means a video that took an hour to upload before now takes 2 minutes. That's a huge change, and for me, well worth the investment. For me, the difference in upload speed and the change to the workflow makes it completely worth the price. As far as I recall, it's about $60 a month for 2 gigabit service, and I'm paying about twice that for 5 gigabit. I'd say if you can get it and it's already installed in your neighborhood, by all means, go for it. You may want to try to get some assurances about any current devices you have that depend on the phones, like alarms and fax machines and so on, and perhaps most importantly, a way to go back if they can't make it work. But if you need an entire build-out contract to get it, proceed with caution. I think that what ultimately stung me is that the person that we originally struck the deal with left the company shortly thereafter, and no person was ever really assigned internal responsibility to see it through. So, while my case was particularly painful, I think it was also kind of an edge case and not something you'll face in a typical fiber install. And that's largely why I'm not outing the fiber company by name, even though it's not that hard to figure out. Plus, I don't want Dennis showing up here with a gang of off-duty motorcycle phone cops. Wake up, sucker! This is the phone company we're talking about. <laughs> I mean, they see everything, they know everything. They got their own covert police force. If you found any of today's episode to be interesting or entertaining, please remember that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. And if you're already a subscriber, thanks. Please consider turning on all notifications for the channel so that you don't miss an episode. If once a week turns out to be too often, you can always turn it back off. If you or somebody you know may be on the autism spectrum, check out my free sample of my book on Amazon. It's everything I know about living your best life on the spectrum. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.